you on the first try. So welcome to the last program of the 2023 Great Southern Viaduct Winter Lecture Series. Um, for those of you who were trying to get coffee, and we, when we uh, apparently ran out, we are brewing more, so it will be available soon. So please uh, go and help yourself. <laughs> so like I said, this, this is our last program this year, and it's, it's gone by way too quickly. Uh, but it's been a great pleasure and an honor for the library to, to host this for the 10th year in partnership with the Great Stone Viaduct Historical Education Society. Uh, it takes a lot of work and planning to bring these programs to you year after year, so let's give a big round of applause to the Great Stone Viaduct And uh, I do hope to see you all back next year for the 11th annual series. It's great to see so many of you here tonight for the final program. We've already had a record-breaking attendance this year, and this turnout for this program is a nice way to end the series. Um, as a reminder, if you've missed any of your programs, we do live stream these. Hello to everybody watching online. Um, they are live streamed to our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. And then the day following the program, we put them up on our website. Uh, the 2020, 2021, and 2022 programs are also available on our website if you'd like to see previous year's programs. And then uh, any of you, this is the first program for any of you. First program you're attending this? Cool. Okay, for the new people, if you're wondering where the library or where the library this is the library. <laughs> the, the library bathrooms are. Uh, if you go through that hallway there and take a left, there, there's a hallway, the bathrooms are on the, the right and the left there, the men's and the women's. And then out of respect for our speakers tonight, we do ask that everybody please silence their cell phones at this time. <clears throat> the last week I mentioned that we have a brand new book club, the Paholics Anonymous Book Swap. Uh, we drove we drew our book titles for that. Um, works a little differently from most book clubs. Everybody puts in a, um, an anonymous book title of their choice, a book that they recommend, and then they pull an anonymous one out. Um, if you did not make it to the library on Friday to do that, and you still like to sign up for our book club, the hat, the Leprechaun hat is on the back table there. You can put a book title in and draw one out. We will be meeting on April. April 27th, that's a Thursday from noon to one o'clock, and you'll get to tell us what you loved about the book that you randomly chose or what you hated about it, and then whoever recommended it will reveal themselves, maybe, if you didn't it too much. And then we'll also have a potluck, so it, it should be a lot of fun if you can make that April 27th at noon. And um, also on the back table, we've got brochures for our story times that's running through April. And then we'll have a hiatus in May, and uh, we'll start back up for our summer reading program, which will run from June 14th through, the, through July 26th. So it's going to be an eight-week program this year. All together now, we're going to have a service theme. It's going to be a lot of fun, so stay tuned for more information on our summer reading program. Um, we also have some brochures for Dolly Parkinson's Imagination. Some of you have probably tired of me talking about that, but if you don't know what it is, it's a great program where kids from newborn to age five, get three books every month in the mailbox. So if you have, uh, if you know families who have kids under the age of five, please pick up the brochure for our story time and for Dolly Parton's Imagination program. They're both free, um, so it's a great way to get kids interested in reading early on. So um, now that I've told you all about everything that's going on here at the library, I'm going to pass on the microphone to Erica Keller, who is the committee chair for the Great Stone Five and Lecture Series. Well, thank you. Oh, sorry. It's really short. Um, good evening, everyone. This is our last one. And um, thank you so much for coming out this year. And thank you so much for being part of our winter lecture series. As always, um, even though the season might be ending, um, please check out our website um, and uh, Facebook page. Um, the Great Show Vida, we do have a lot of exciting things coming up. Um, always check in with us from time to time, um, year after year. We have our, our banquet coming up in the fall, as always. And so if there's anything you're interested in about our society, please check us out on Facebook or our website. And um, we'd love to have you as a member, if you're not already a member. And please, if you if you'd like to join, we have information on the back table. Um, we'd love to have you. Um, so as we draw to a close, one quick uh, housekeeping. Um, this was left last week. Does anyone, would this be anyone's? Yeah. 
Oh, they left it tonight. I'm sorry, they left it on the back. I thought it was warm. I was like, that's a good <laughs>
I decided to study medicine myself, and of course, it was practically unheard of for a woman to practice medicine. And, but I persevered, and I attended the Western Homeopathic uh, Hospital or College in Cleveland, and then I went on and went to the female department of uh, Pennsylvania Medical Center, and I graduated in Philadelphia in 1860. And my goodness, I'm proud to say that I was the first woman to graduate from the medical college and the first woman in West Virginia to practice medicine. We were so proud of you, and we still are, even though you're older. <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't very long after that that there was the horrible beginning of the Civil War. We were so shocked when Fort Sumter was fired upon there in South Carolina. That was on April 14th of 1861. Then President Lincoln called for 75,000 <coughs> troops to put down the rebellion. He thought that could take place in about three months. Oh, was he wrong? Oh, what frightening times of time. Terrible, terrible time. That many of us uh, felt very strong allegiance to Virginia. And so just two days after Fort Sumner, uh, the battle there, I wrote a note to Jefferson Davis and I offered my services to him. I remember. And you know, he was very nice and wrote me a lovely letter back, which I still have. But he declined my offer. It's probably good because it's better that you stay in really high where proper services were needed. Uh, you know, it was just about a month after that that there was a vote for Virginia to join the South and secede from the Union. Oh, that was the talk of the town. Remember that? Oh, oh my yes. goodness. Yes. Every street corner was talking about that. And, and you know, Albert felt very strongly that we should support Virginia in that secession movement. So he decided to vote to leave the Union. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. And of course, women couldn't vote. But I'm sure that if, if I'd been allowed to, I would have been the first one in line to sign and to add my name to the list. You know, our brother also signed the ordinance along with several other men who worked in this tailoring business. And uh, some of our friends, very outstanding men in the community, like William and John Goshorn and Arthur Phillips and his son, and Daniel and Lewis Steenrod, and, and Ebenezer Zane, and his no, son, his, his son, yes. I'm sorry, his son Eugene, yes. Sorry, correct me, I'm old. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it seemed as though that the mill workers, though the immigrants, submitted with the union, and therefore we lost. The boat. Yes. But there were many men from throughout Virginia, especially the western part of Virginia, who came to Wheeling to meet in the Custom House to form a new government. Right, oh. right here in Wheeling. My goodness, that well, was, it didn't really seem legal to me, but they came. Well, they, and I could never pronounce that theater. In the Academy of Well, I'm sorry. It's incredible. The Alcanian Theater was turned into a chair. <laughs> Doesn't work. And some of the local Southern supporters were resting out there. And you'll remember that some of us ladies met and we were to try to collect money yes. to get the people out of jail. Yes. And then we were arrested on August of 1861. And fortunately, though, John Goshorn, bless his heart, paid for our bail and we were released. Well, I remember John Goshorn quite well, and then his son was named William, if you recall. Yes, I do. You may also remember that they were involved with that scandal at the time when one of their slaves escaped and went all the way to Cleveland. Her name was Lucy. Yes, Lucy Bagby, if I remember correctly. But, you know, they had their bill of sale that could prove that she was their property. Oh, and they went all the way uh, to bring her back. Right, even though the local abolitionists in Cleveland tried to buy Lucy and set her free from the Goshwans. But you know, and they were going to bring her back to Wheeling too. 
And after all, though, there was a fugitive slave act. And so they were, they were not allowed to do that because the gosh ones had every right to take her back. She and they, was their property. That's right. And they did. And they sent her to live with relatives downstate so that she had the less chance of uh, escaping. It was also during that summer that Alfred started writing to newspapers in Baltimore. The Baltimore Daily Exchange, I think, was the newspaper of his choice. Now, he only signed his initial H, but you can look back in the newspapers from that time and you can find a couple of his letters. And it was obvious that he was talking about whaling at the time. You know, he talked about he could go around town and see southern flags. Not very often, but you would see Union flags on the homes of people who we knew were southern supporters. <sighs> oh my goodness. He also criticized a lot of the men who came to Wheeling to form the new government. He, he thought they were rather pompous, and they came with their own prejudices, and they were just really men of obscurity who wanted to become famous in some way. I'm just looking for power. Yes, they were. And I remember seeing some of those letters, and he reported on two men who were arrested in Wheeling for hawaii Jeff Davis. Oh, yes. Yeah, and also on the, there were ministers who left the city because they refused to contaminate their religion by praying for Lincoln and his government. Well, rightfully so. Well, I know. And it's too bad that the government shut down the newspaper because I felt that Alfred had a lot more to say. Yes, yes, indeed. It was also the time when our family nearly split apart, if you recall. Your brother Thomas, Alfred's brother Thomas as well, you may remember had started working as an apprentice for a tailor when he was just a teenager. The family that ran the tailoring business was um, John and Mary Leach. But John died shortly after that, and Thomas stayed working for the tailor business. Of course, he did join with Alfred and signed the Ordinance of Secession, but when he was threatened with jail, he relented and signed the Oath of Allegiance, pledging his allegiance not only to the United States government, but also to the restored government of Virginia. Yes. Oh, oh, well, I'm sure it was that terrible, terrible Mary Leach. Oh, uh, she convinced him oh. to sign that oath of allegiance. Oh. oh, my gosh. I was so glad that I wrote her a letter telling her what I thought of her. Do you remember what you wrote? Oh, I do. I still have a copy. And let me read a part of this to you to see what you think and agree with me. Mary Leach, you have been for years the kept mistress and the blackest curse to our family that God then lived. You used the prostitution that succeeded in tearing from a widowed mother a son and from an orphan sister her brother. Yet even this is nothing compared to your infernal and incarnate low, degrading, and abused influence thrown around my brother to induce him to stain his soul and degrade his principles and forfeit his manhood by taking that contemptible oath that he had sworn time and again that he would never do. And you used your base low, you like those words, oh, <laughs> base low, ignorant mind well, and he, and I also wrote, she promoted Thomas in taking that oath. Well, I also said, you have also been offering yourself in the various hotels to prostitute your old dry stinking carpets, you vile old hall. Now that is a strong way that I have ever heard of. And you know, Mary was 20 years older than Thomas. I don't know if he really saw anything in her, but oh my goodness. I think that he just wanted 
she just wanted to keep him loyal to help with the tailoring business. You know, they had 135 employees at the time, and no way, even with her wiles, could Mary keep all of those folks in line. <laughs> Are you sure about that? <laughs> well, I agree. But Mary took offense at what I had written on Kim that And actually sued me. She sued me. I remember yeah. that. And your letter came out in court. Yes, it did. And it was months before it came to court. And I eventually lost. But I had to apologize and I had to retract my words. Did you cross your fingers? I lost all of them. <laughs> <laughs> and but the good thing about that was I didn't have the damages. Oh, that's right. She wanted extensive damages. Oh, she did. Oh, what, she did. What, a, oh, oh, what a trash bag. <laughs> Such language. <laughs> well, I remember at that time there was a great deal of pressure in the community for the men to sign the Oath of Allegiance. Every person who had a license to do business in Wheeling was expected to sign. That included doctors, Dentists, bankers, lawyers, ministers, even toll collectors. It required the signers to swear allegiance to the United States Constitution and government, and also to swear allegiance to the newly formed, restored government of Virginia that they had formed right here in the Yes, they did. Well, most women weren't expected to sign, but probably because I had been so vocal in my support of secession that Provost Marshal Major Jar came and and I tried to put him off and say come back the next day and this was on August the 18th, 1862. No. No. He came back the next day and it was persistent. Oh yeah, I said the I could have just run him out, but I didn't. And um, but anyway he came back and I refused to sign. So here we go. I was arrested again. I was getting familiar with that jail. And he carted me off. I mean, geez. Oh, I was so tired of fighting, though, at that point. You know, I just, I didn't go ahead and sign. Yes, well, you didn't want to be stuck in jail. No, no, I didn't go no. again. But you know, the mother told me that one of her neighbors saw Mary Leach rejoicing when you were arrested. No and saying that she hoped you would never be released. What a detestable person. Wasn't she? I would dance on her grave. <laughs> By that time, Alfred and two other men had been arrested for failing to sign the Oath of Allegiance. And, and you know, they were sent to Camp Chase and Columbus, and I certainly didn't want to go there. That's for sure. Oh my goodness, I remember that day. June 6, 1862, I will never forget the day my beloved Alfred was taken away and sent to the Union prison, along with William Goshorn and Judge George Thompson, two other very prominent men. Yes, they were. For the information of our guests, William Goshorn was the son of John Goshorn. Now, you've already shared the story of their uh, claiming Lucy Bagley and taking her back to Wheeling. So I suppose John Goshorn, William's father, must have agreed to sign the oath because he wasn't arrested with the others. Right. But he was pretty old then, too. Yeah, William was 48 years old at the time. And 48. <laughs> yeah, but his father would have been a good bit older. Oh, so. yes, that's probably why he wasn't arrested. Probably so. He was a, a very wealthy businessman and he just lived on North uh, Main Street, right uh, across the alley from her mother and I. Right. And uh, so we knew him very well. And his sisters, Del and Mandy, met with a group of other ladies. And it's so funny because they were selling shirts for the Shriver Grace. And so when they came, the Confederate, or the people came to, to see what they were doing and they were going to arrest them. They said they were they were selling blouses. Yes. Yeah. So they they were they were released. <laughs> Rather large blouses and all gray. Yes, all gray. Yes. yes. <laughs> you might remember that um, William Goshorn had a sister named Isabella. She died in a mental institution. Though. 
Um, but that was before the war broke out. She had been married to a man named Benjamin Franklin Kelly. And Kelly actually led the Union forces in the first battle of the Civil War at Philippine, and later became a general in the Union Army. Now, it's probably better that she passed away. Can you imagine living in a household when your father and your brother are such ardent Southern supporters and your husband is a Union general? Oh, my goodness, that would be very difficult. Well, Judge Thompson was another story. You know, he was 56 years old at the time that he was arrested. He was the oldest of the, the three. Right. And uh, he had not signed the Ordinance of Secession. In fact, he was against Virginia seceding from the Union. And he refused to sign. But why, why did he refuse? Well, because it required him to swear allegiance to the restored government of Virginia. And with this legal background, yeah. he said that that government, that government was illegal. And so he wouldn't sign because of that. So his wife Elizabeth, who was a steam rod, both her great uncle Daniel and her uncle Lewis had signed the ordinance of secession. And they were harassed by the authorities to sign the note. But poor Lewis was on his deathbed. Yes. Oh my. And he died a few months later. And I never heard Daniel sign that oath or not. But he wasn't arrested with the others. Definitely was a difficult time. You know, my health was never very good. And, and with Alfred gone, there I was to take care of all five children. The oldest, Tommy, was just 11 at the time. And little Allie, the baby, was just three. The two oldest girls, Mary was nine, and then Lizzie was seven, uh, they were students at Mount Deschamps. Oh, yes, yes. yes. And uh, two of William Goshorn's daughters were there as well. Delia, little Delia, oh, the character, was home with me at the time. Well, at least we were able to write to Alfred while he was in prison. And uh, even though we had to be careful what we wrote because they were censoring our letters. Right. And uh, he and I had a joint medical practice, as you know. And so many times I would write to him and ask him about procedures and what I could do and things like that. And then I also, one time I just thought, oh, I don't have anything else to ask. So I included a very long account of a book that I had read about Napoleon. Oh! I know, I know. Well, I just gave it to him and hoped that maybe it would give him something to think about while he was being in prison. I'm sure he enjoyed that. I always try to be very positive with my correspondence, but as you say, we had to watch what we wrote. And I tried to assure him that my health was good, that I was feeling better and improving and the children were doing well. I also asked him advice on how to collect some of the bills that were due to him from his medical practice. That was very difficult at the time, and, and I was concerned that there wasn't enough money to run our household. Oh, yeah. You also told me that you included some letters and lighthearted light stories about Delia. Oh, that Delia. What a cat bird she was. What a handful. You know, she taught little Allie to go around telling people Lincoln took my papa to jail. And she suggested to her father in a letter that he said that he liked Lincoln. But then when he came home, he could say he liked Jefferson Davis. And more than once, I caught her visiting the Union Quartermaster Department, actually sitting on the lap of one of the soldiers and telling them, Please let Papa out of prison. And one time she even said, I'll give you my piano if you'll let me. Oh, how sweet of her. Other times she was a devil. Oh, what a character <laughs> she was. She was a handful. I remember how upset we all were when William Gosselin gave that for only two months in confinement and returned us to the oath. It's all pretty not good, though, and I think he suffered horribly while he was in prison. <laughs> Even though he remained uh, a gentleman to the end, you know, he even asked his wife to send him a summer weight black tie. <laughs> and then about a month and a, about a month and a half after that, William came home. Excuse me. And Judge Thompson was allowed to come home as well, and he didn't even sign the oath. 
Now, both men are still living in Wheeling, and they're okay, and everything is okay. I'm sure maybe you could stop by them while you're still in town. I may visit, yes, although I'm still a little upset that they were released long before Alfred was. Uh, but every time I wrote to him, I tried to tell him that I would rather have him stay there in prison than to give up in return if he thought that that was a dishonorable thing to do. I understand that. You probably heard that Judge Thompson, his wife Elizabeth, visited the sick bed of her Uncle Lewis Steenrod. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. While Lewis was writing his will. Oh, how convenient. <laughs> well, many of us were disappointed, and rightly so, but we weren't very surprised because of her, basically. That Lewis, uh, and then you know that Lewis, he didn't leave a penny to his sister. And she was a poor widow that had nothing. And he had been supporting her for so long. But you know who got all the money? Elizabeth Thompson received the bulk of the business state. Oh my goodness. Well, finally, in January of 1863, Alfred was exchanged. Nobody seemed to be helping him. And so he was very fortunate in meeting some prisoners, some other prisoners who were sent to Camp Chase, who reported that in a recent battle, they had captured a man by the name of Samuel Pancoast. Now, Alfred remembered that name. Samuel Pancoast. Oh, yes, yeah, Samuel Pancoast was the brother of Dr. Seth Pancoast, and he had been one of Alfred's instructors in college. And so Alfred wrote and suggested that they exchange him with Samuel Pancoast, and that's how it happened that he was finally released. Mm -hmm. Well, I remember how sad it was to see your house of food being sold at Parker Park Center. Oh my. I suppose at that time we knew we would never come back to do anything. That's true, but we had to sell things that we couldn't take with us, and we couldn't really stay in field. We decided that at least in the short term that Mary and Lizzie would stay in Mount Deshaunel, and we'd take the other three children with us. But even without those two girls, you know, we had 13 trunks of luggage. <laughs> well, First we went to Baltimore, and that wasn't so hard because the Vietnam Railroad was still ran when we were in Baltimore, and, and that was all behind Union Lines, so that was okay. But then we had to cross Union Lines to get to Richmond, and that meant we had to get a permit from the Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton. Well, we did get that permission, and we went under a flag of truce to cross into Confederate territory. But partway there, we were stopped, and Alfred was arrested on general suspicion. Fortunately, he was able to continue after we got letters of, of support from some of the other wheeling men who had gone to Richmond before us. They swore that Alfred was loyal to the South, and we were able to proceed. That's good. Thirteen times on. Thirteen times well, it, it takes a lot of room to pack our important clothing. So, just a little bit at the top. <laughs> I think you told me that one of those letters was from really native Charles Wells Russell. Yes, it was. I remember him. He was the attorney who defended the suspension bridge when Pittsburgh <coughs> wanted it torn down. Right? Oh, yes. And when he left Wheeling at the beginning of the war, uh, Marshall Norton confiscated his house on 12th Street, and he turned it into the headquarters for General Rosecrans and Fremont and, uh, when they were stationed here. I remember that. That's right. Yes, the letters certainly helped. We were very appreciative. Even so, though, when we arrived in Richmond with 13 trucks, yeah, we, we created quite a stir. You see, at the time, it was very difficult to even get a small packet across enemy lines. But with 13 trunks, people 
people actually thought we were some official peace envoy. <laughs> of course, that wasn't true. <laughs> I was so proud that my brother stepped up right away and was elected to the Virginia legislature representing Ohio County. I was very proud of him. And while in that role, he suggested enlisting slaves in the Southern ranks. But I don't think that ever happened. Um, and it was really nice to know that Mrs. Robert P. Lee was one of his patients while you were in Richmond. Yes, that's right. We, we did circulate in the best company while we were there. And we settled quite well into Richmond. And sadly, while we were there, our little alley died. And as you know, eventually we had five more children. But I'll always miss that dear sweet boy. There's a cure for that, Mary. <laughs> I was so, we'll talk later. Yes, we I was so sorry to hear your mom. I really was. I'm sure Alfred did everything that he could to save him. Yeah. I did hear several times from Tommy, though, while we were in Richmond. Oh, he seemed to thrive once his father, Damon Whitner, came home and joined the family. It was so nice. He told me that he was able to accompany Alfred in various events where he met several Confederate leaders, and including President Jeff Davis, Vice President uh, Alexander Stevens, and General <coughs> John Hunt Morgan, and Jamie Stewart and Jubal Early. And Tommy also reported that he attended the very impressive, impressive funeral of Stonewall Jackson. Yes, that's right. Wow. Also, while we were there, you may recall that the Union had burned the Virginia Military Institute. And the cadets who were there, who were too young to go and fight, came to Richmond to continue their education during that time period. Now, Tommy was only 14 by then, but they allowed him to take classes along with the other cadets. And that school, of course, was called the West Point of the South. So he got a very good education in regular schooling, in addition to being able to meet all the luminaries. And that's wonderful. What an opportunity for him. Yes, it was. And your daughter, Mary and Leslie, Lizzie, my goodness, they're also, they were also doing well at this time. They were in Mount Deshaun, as you had said. And mother, and your mother, and sister Hannah, and I, all uh, we were always there and available to them for anything that they needed and so much appreciated that was but so far away i miss them so much that actually a lady friend and i tried to go back to wheeling just to visit once you see albert had enough connections that he was able to arrange for a covered confederate ambulance two mules and a colored driver to take us back toward wheeling we also had letters of introduction for places that we might stop along the way. And all went well for the first three days of the journey, but then we came to the Potomac, and to cross that blockade was the big problem. Yeah. I know you didn't reach Wheeling. What happened then? Well, the only way to cross the Potomac was a fire river, and we knew that we had to wait until it was a very dark night, the water was still, and there were no Union soldiers around. Well, the first two things were fine. It was a dark night, no moon, no stars. The water was calm. We're in the boat, ready to cross the Potomac, and there was a Union gunboat. So we had to turn around, and we never made it to wheel to see the girls. Oh, my. That's sad, but thank goodness you made it. Yes, we made it back. Oh, wow. Well, as you know, I continued to practice medicine in Wheeling, and I lived and worked out of my office in my childhood home, and uh, that was on North Main Street. Well, first I had very few patients, and then uh, money was very tight. So I began advertising in the newspaper in around 1863, and that did get me some more patients. But, uh, the one thing that happened, it was sad, but it helped. Our older brother John died in 1870, and then mother died in 1872. So 
at that point, the family estate was um, considerable, and it allowed me to then increase my uh, practice. And so, therefore, I became well known as far as being um, highly regarded, regarded as a physician. And having that part of your inheritance will certainly help take the, the money issues away. Yes, yes. yes. I'm so glad that everything worked out for you well. And they worked out well uh, for Thomas, too. His tailoring business eventually was the largest in the entire state. I didn't realize it was large, that large. Yes. Well, you know that that dreadful Mary Lee died in 1868. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> Would you believe that she names Thomas as the executor of her estate? Mm. It makes me wonder. Yes, it does. it does. Our young nephew, Elwood, entered Thomas's business in about, I think it was around 1867, and, and eventually took over most of the work. And he and Thomas seemed to get along okay, even though Elwood fought for the North, for the Union. Yes. And Thomas was okay with that, I guess. So Thomas then moved to Baltimore in 1873, but I think he'll be back in New York sometime. I think he will too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, after the war, as you know, we left Richmond and we moved to Baltimore as well. And Alfred established a very profitable business there, medical practice. Uh, he died, as you know, last year. He was only 56 years old. And our youngest son, Charles, was just seven at the time. Now, with all of my health issues, I just thought there is no way that I could raise that little boy by myself when all the other children had grown up and gone. And so, Charles went to live with our oldest daughter, Mary. Both she and Lizzie had married uh, Confederate veterans, oh, and they were living well. And, uh, and and Charles, Charles will have a much happier upbringing, I'm sure, with Mary. They're in Fredericksburg. Oh, oh really? Fredericksburg. Oh, can you get to see them? Uh, occasionally. And your son Thomas? Oh, was he was able to complete his education and graduated from the University of Virginia Law School. Oh, I know you're proud of him. Oh, I am. He was married about six years ago, and they had several children, and it's just a joy to be a grandmother. Oh, I'm sure. You have a lot of kids to be a grandmother, too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yes, that's the end of our story. The horrible war is now long past. And so, with much needless suffering and pain on both sides, perhaps we can now look forward to a continued rebuilding of our union. Thank you. We do have a bit of the rest of the story. Yes, we do. Um, Eliza Keating died in the spring of 1882, and she was on a train traveling to Portland, Ohio, to see one of her patients. And she arrived in Portland at 5.25 p.m. and apparently in the best of health. And she was met at the straight, uh, train station by two of her women friends. And a rain was coming, and so she told the two women friends to go on ahead to the house. And she was going to stay there and, and uh, wait. Uh, with a gentleman by the name of William Clevis because he had an umbrella and he could walk her up. Well, when they were sitting there, um, Eliza stopped for a few minutes and she reached in her uh, satchel and she took some medicine. And Mr. Clevis asked her if she was ill. And she said, yes, I'm very ill. And so um, he summoned doctors that came from Portland. And when they came, they, there were four of them that came, and they did everything they could, but she died at 6.30 p.m. And it's really not known, probably a heart attack, stroke, um, blood clot, something, but it's, we don't know what she died from. Now, Mary was complaining her entire life about her ill health, and she lived another 29 years after <laughs> <hours. laughs> She lived until 1909. She was 77 years old. Uh, 
Thomas Hughes, the tailor, did move back to Wheeling in 1884, and he resumed uh, an active part in his business. Um, he died in Wheeling two years later, leaving behind a daughter and two sons, one of whom is the ancestor of a man also named Thomas Hughes, who we've been in touch with, uh, who lives in the Baltimore area. Uh, Mary and Alfred's son, Adrian Hughes, was born while they were in Baltimore. And one of his descendants is also in touch with us and is helping us go through some of the letters that still exist in the family. And little Delia, we don't know what happened to Delia. She shows up in the Baltimore census at age 13, and we can find no evidence of her after that. It's possible that she moved to New York, but there were several women whose name was Delia, or Adelia was her formal name, Adelia Hughes. We don't really know what happened. So, what we have based this story on is the actual records that are available from that time period. While Dr. Alfred was in prison, Mary wrote to him on a regular basis, and occasionally uh, Eliza wrote as well. Those letters, or copies of those letters, do exist. And just last week, there was an original letter from Mary to Dr. Hughes in prison camp that showed up on eBay, and it sold a couple of days ago for $282 for one letter. Now, also the rest of the story, why do we care about these people? Um, Judy and I are both part of Friends of Wheeling, and Friends of Wheeling is rehabilitating a house on North Main Street in Wheeling, which was originally built by Thomas Hughes Sr., the gunsmith who was the father of Eliza and Alfred and, and Thomas and so forth. And that I was interested in the family, and as we rehab that house and we keep finding other interesting things. We now have a third descendant that we've been in touch with, and um, it's interesting to find out more about the family after this generation. So, we thank you for your attention. You. Uh, if there's time, if anyone has any questions, we can try to answer. We covered it, Mary. We did. <laughs> <laughs>
summer again next year. We'll be here same time, same place, every February, March, on Wednesday. So thank you all so much for coming.